the truth of the matter is there are times when I like my own voice and uh, every now and then I come out with something important to my that, that I've heard for the first time myself. Hmm, that's hard. Not for what I did, but for who I am. Because, well, what's the difference be between what I did and who I am? Who I am is eternal. What I did is temporary. All things are subject to change. And, and when you see the um, the images on there, I did some things with India ink, where you get... Uh, so I start talking to him, and I was selling the, the, the um, marvelous wonders of LSD, right? And the more I'm talking, the higher I'm getting. And all of a sudden, I look out the window, and everything is breaking up in front of me and I, that had never happened to me before or since and but that was the effect of the LSD no I didn't have any but talking about it oh so I got what they call a flashback which I had never experienced so talking about it it's like having an orgasm without the sex well that's what that happens when you jerk off you know <laughs> I mean I hate to say I was born in Philadelphia, in New York. My father was a gangster and my mother was a singer. My mother was the kind of person who other people came to see, other, other acts and other stars. They came to see her, she was good. I mean, really good. 
I don't think that uh, uh, that I don't even think that bad people are bad people. You know, um, this was their lifestyle. You know, uh, and uh, if you look at the Cosa Nostra and you look at at, at the mafia, they were in a way they were protectors. They never, they, they did things for the people in their neighborhoods. They never killed their own. You know, it was, a funny way, it was a funny way of life. And it worked for them, but it scared the shit out of me. Who taught me to swim? Al Capone's brother taught me how to swim. Uh, and, and some movie actors taught me how to swim too. A fellow by the name of Buster Crab who played Tarzan in the early Tarzan films. But I was, uh, when when Buster Crab taught me how to swim, I, I might have been six or seven years old. You see, 1935. Yeah, I could have been, yeah, I could have been, let's say five or six years old. Yeah, but, but, uh, the war, I got there 14 days before the armistice was called. But still in all, uh, uh, the North Koreans had, uh, out, of the, out of the plane, so it, in a sense, I was a combat veteran. <laughs> I found it uh, one of the most interesting times in my life. I learned more about myself and people than I have learned previously, but I was still young. I was 17 to 20. I was in the army for three years. I ran 12,000 miles to get away from my home life. Why did I run? Why did I want to leave? Because I was very unhappy there. It, do, it doesn't matter that, you know, um, Parents are parents are parents. And you have to be pretty clever to be able to read everything correctly in your mind. The first time was 1966. And why did you come? Why did I come? I, God, I can't remember why I came to England. I guess because I was, what? I was 30 going on 15, you know. I, I uh, I'd never been anywhere in my life, with the exception of the army. And I, why did I come to England? I think what was going on in England must have uh, impressed me. People would be coming back, going and coming back, telling me what was happening, or telling people what was happening, and I somehow found out. Wow. So did you come with a, a job in mind, or did you just come to have a look? What, to England? Yes. No, no. My job was my projector. <laughs> that was my job. And I ended up working in a, in a, a wire mill. So you, you brought some slides with you. Oh, definitely. Uh, but ended up doing a job in a factory because... I ended up... Uh, I came... I came to England in, what, what month was that? How long was I here before um, the Roundhouse came about? And I didn't even know what the Roundhouse was. And I didn't know anything about, uh, it's like pop-up happenings all over the place, you know? Just, just out of, out of sheer, sheer joy. It was an interesting time. You're a real shit, you know that, don't you? You want to know about the women in my life? Wow, that's a hard one. God. Why that, is it so hard? I don't know, because there weren't that many. But you got married? Yes, I got married. My wife and I got married. She was a singer. And my father owned a nightclub. And she was at the nightclub for an audition, and I met her, and we never separated for a great many years, just like that. We moved in together almost immediately, and it was lust at first sight. She was a beautiful woman. 
I was a good looking kid and we got along great. And what about children? What about you? Oh. What about children? I had two children, a daughter, and my son died when he was 14. He died of um, um, asthma. Oops, what did I drop? Hang on. No, no, it's okay. I dropped this thing. He died of asthma before asthma was, was known as a killer. He was a beautiful boy. And the daughter? She was a beautiful girl. She ended up being a singer for a while. Uh, the page three girls of the Sun newspaper, they were starting a group and my daughter ended up becoming one of them. And she ended up doing everything. She wrote the songs, she, she arranged the harmonies, runs in the family. Oh, my my uh, wife's father was a, a big comedian in England. He worked with an, a comic here named Will Hay. Oh yes, Will Hay is quite well known. Yep. And he was a cheeky, cheeky schoolboy. And he was in, in films. He did everything. Yes. Yeah, so basically, show business has been a, a big part of my life. Tell me, do you believe in synchronicity? Only when it's happening. <laughs> do I believe in synchronicity? I don't know. God was created by man. That's my definition of God. I didn't say that spirituality was, was created by man. Spirituali spirituality is... It, it, you're dealing with with the human spirit, which really it's hard to define what the human human spirit is. Wow. Oh, do I believe in life after death? A better question would be: Do I believe in life after life? And uh, I believe that something happens. But your human consciousness remains out of the, the equation because it's your human consciousness. But what is consciousness? Huh? You tell me. Philosophy? My God, philosophy is a, is a creation of man. If man's made it, man's going to screw it up. Yeah. I have hope in, in hope in in mankind probably killing itself off. That's the only thing that I I, I can believe man's going to do. You know, do you know anything that man has done that is a productive thing? He invented the World Wide Web. And look at all the damage that's caused. For all the good, for all the good that it does, uh, just watch the news, you'll see what it does to kids. I, I, I believe that music is the hope of the world. I believe that music is, is a life-giving thing. But how many people nowadays are into the heartfelt music that the world is, is, is yearning for. You said man can find music in everything, right? Is that true? I believe it's true. So even a small child with no training whatever would find... Look at Kylie Malone. Minogue. <laughs> I do. I like to look at Kylie Minogue. Look. I think she's wonderful. Go back to uh, that Saturday, October the 16th, yeah. 1966. Can you tell us uh, how you, well, what you did that evening? What I did that evening? 
Okay, I'll try and start from the beginning. My friend drove us to the roundhouse that evening. Is this Hoppy? No, this is Jack Braceland. He owns uh, Five Acres Nudist Colony. Right. And um, we went up the stairs and uh, then he and my wife and some other people disappeared. And I was stuck there with somebody who I think turned out to be Sid Barrett, but I'm not even sure anymore now. And we got extremely high because I had brought a chunk of Lebanese, <laughs> Lebanese hashish and we got extremely high. And a lot of people were coming in and then I don't know, I think something happened where they were called out to do their set and uh, I had a I had a, a, a projector that I eventually used as a handheld projector, which was kind of weird, man. But you must have gone there with slides already prepared. I went there with slides. How many did you have? Oh dear, how many did I have? Roughly. About 40 or 50. And uh, I really didn't know which ones I was going to set up to show because actually they weren't in any order what, whatsoever. And I had mixed up all the ones that moved with the ones that didn't move. So, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a bit of a mishmash. And I ended up standing on a flatbed wagon with that projector in my hands and then the music started playing. Who was on first? Because the soft machine were on there as well as... Uh, yeah, the, I think the soft machine were on first. Or they could have been on last because things got sort of mixed up. Because we didn't have any, any set playlist or anything. In any case, it was a very extremely interesting night. And after the party, Jack had hired a room in the roundhouse and he had a case of champagne in there. So on, on, on top of what we smoked, we drank a lot more. And from that point on, I'm afraid, I don't know what happened. I don't know where we went, when we went, or how we went, or even if we went. There was a woman in Japan, wasn't there? Like, there oh, was a Japanese woman who I fell in love with. Called Michiko. Michiko, yes, you remember, because of, of Michiko, the other Japanese woman. Yes. And she kept in touch with me for a couple of years after. How did you meet her? She was a courtesan. I met her in a hotel. She was assigned to the hotel. And uh, she, um, so I paid for her. Before the two weeks were up, she was paying for me because I ran out of money. <laughs> Poor dear one. And I think she actually, uh, that she had been pregnant. And it was my child. But you never heard? Never heard in a million years. Because there were a couple other women in in Korea that were just, you know. Mm. I was 17 years old. How old was she? 31. <laughs> uh, so that's when you became a man. No, that's when I became human. My first sexual experience was at the age of 15. And that's as far as I'm going with that story. That was in America. Yeah. That was in America. How old was she? There were two. Mm -hmm. And we screwed them all night. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, you pretty little dear. Why, what's this thing about dogs? You, I love dogs. I, yeah, I know you love dogs. I don't know why. But it's much more... I know, it's, it, it's almost like an obsession with me. It is an obsession. Yeah. Because you can't seem to go past a dog without... No, I think, a, I think they're beautiful creatures. I just love them. 
I can't say any more than that. You can't. You don't feel the same way about cats. No, but I love cats too. In fact, there's nothing with four feet that I don't love. I love big cats too. I love tigers and I love lions. Uh, if I believed in reincarnation, I could be reborn into anything I wanted to be. And you don't believe in reincarnation? No, I don't. I don't see the purpose of it. Mm. Not everything needs a purpose. Well, it, it, look, not everything needs a purpose. That's what Can I, I go? I, I can't go th through this life with a completely purposeless existence. Do you know how heartbreaking that would be? What, to realize it at the end of your life or to... To realize that the only reason that you're here is because you're here. Mm. <laughs> no, I, I find that would be such a shame. Even love would be out of the play, out of, out, of, out of the ballpark, really. I was in the army, come back from Korea, was stationed in... Uh, Aberdeen, Maryland, at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds. And uh, because it was a security guard outfit, military police security guard outfit, we pulled duty in the... Um, in that area of, of the camp that needed duty pulled because they had machines, they had uh, all kinds of expensive stuff, obsolete obsolete uh, guns, obsolete this, and I had a, uh, I bought a uh, 22 caliber 9 millimeter H&R, Harrington and Richardson pistol, shot nine shots, and so I was 17 and I thought I was king shit, and I was going to kill this deer, and I shot it nine times. From a distance or close up? From a, a from close enough to be able to see the bullets hit. That's pretty close. The deer was in, in the area and the deer wasn't moving away from me. And I, this poor deer was suffering so badly that I took out my 45 and I killed it. And from that time on, I have never had any feelings about I I had never had any idea about killing an animal anymore. But hunting I would never do. Never I I'd never hunt an animal for what reason? No, I find this very weird place to be in this world right now. Well, you've broken your arm recently. Yeah. Um, how does that change things? Oh dear. I know you're in pain. It hasn't changed anything as far as what I thought about dying was concerned. But uh, it made me feel a bit differently about who I am. Really? Yeah. How so? Because uh, I thought, like I told you, when I was younger, I thought I was invulnerable to everything, and I still thought it until recently I was going to be okay. At one point, I even once thought I was going to get through life without breaking a bone. So then I started breaking bones, you know? What a shitty thing to go through. But I don't know. I've never in any way asked anybody any questions in depth about their, their life, how they experience it, how they experience pain. I hate pain. Who, who loves it? What? Nobody loves it. You'd be surprised. I would be. There are masochistic people in the world who love pain. In 
inflicting it and receiving it. Although I once got in a fight and I got I got punched right in the uh, in the in the head, and I didn't even feel it. You know, you just you move into a different area when your life is when you're fighting for your life. A punch in the head doesn't really mean that much. But working for Kubrick, yeah. did I ever tell you I went to Kubrick's uh, a house? No. I I went to Kubrick's house because Thank you. 